do that. <laughs> oh, I hear the cloud is very nice. It is. It's got a little rain in it, but you know, we'll get there. All right. In case anyone missed it, Mr. Doolittle will be presenting tonight uh, Software Architect as a complexity containment. We'll, we'll get back to that stuff. If you haven't yet grabbed it, um, link, link tree slash padnug will get you to most of the stuff we care about in our world. Uh, we exist because Microsoft created .NET and Intel was a wonderful host for so long that I think we'll just keep them on this slide, even if we don't go back there anytime soon. All right, here are the people who make our things possible. And um, we will start, let's go, soft source. I think, uh, Lori, you should start tonight. Cool, I'll start tonight. Hey, everybody. Uh, if you haven't heard all of this stuff a dozen times before, I'm Lori. Uh, I'm a principal consultant at SoftSource Consulting. We are a local software engineering consultancy. So we uh, send our software engineer consultants out into the world to our clients, usually out into the world at the moment. Of course, everybody's working from home. Um, the company is locally owned and all the consultants are local to the, to the Portland metro area. Uh, and our clients are, are usually local-ish. Uh, what else is there to know? Uh, we're hiring. Um, so if you are a software engineer and um, you know C Sharp or Java or Node, Python, um, I'll share my contact information uh, and you can, I can talk to you about why I've been at SoftSource coming up on seven years now and uh, why I choose to stay there and why uh, I think it's a great place if you're all interested in the, the variety of a consulting lifestyle, why it's a good place to do that. Um, also, if you just wanna connect and expand your network, uh, feel free to connect with me uh, with that data. Um, uh, yeah, I guess if there's anything else, hit me up with questions and I will tell you why I code at SoftSource. That's it for me to go higher now because I've got the uh, the TV down here. Uh, IT motives, I see Lena. There she is. <laughs> Once in a while, everything moves around and I lose track of my humans. Happy March, everybody. Thank you for having another pad nug, another opportunity for us to talk, talk tech. Um, I'm with IT motives. We've been around for 13 years. We're a smaller local agency and we do have positions open. But what we do at IT Motives well is we, we make connections and we um, build relationships in the tech community. So if you want to chat, if you need a reference, if you need um, just somebody to talk to about maybe career opportunities, I am the person to talk to. Uh, I'll put my information in the chat. And we just revised our IT Motives website. We revamped it, made it all sparkly and new. Um, and it looks a lot like, a lot more like we are as a company. So I suggest you check that out. And there's a lot of great links and, um, and information on there also, uh, if you need additional things to do with your busy days. <laughs> well, there's also a great video with that amazing actress from Grimm. From Grimm, yeah. She made a little cameo <laughs> appearance. She, she did it uh, pro bono too. She didn't even get paid for her uh, appearance. She should have paid, gotten paid a lot. <laughs> I, yeah, I there's some note, fun videos. <laughs> I, did, I did send a note to Tony to remind him to make sure she's well compensated. <laughs> right. I don't even know if my agent knows about that or not, but <laughs> we won't say anything. <laughs> he wants he or she wants a cut too. So <laughs> right. I, uh, cut of zero is I think zero, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, <there> you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, um, Rich. You bet. Uh Danielle is not Danielle has uh, a lot of evenings uh, booked so she's been she's been busy but she did send a love note to the group and says hi to everybody and let her know I will I will try to gather up her uh, contact info and, and post it also since see, she's not able to do that right now that's tech systems did I say that part I can't recall let's see uh, Robert half Stephen 
There's that unmute button. Hey, everybody. It's Stephen with, uh, with Robert Half Technology. I think I was looking over the, the participant list. I think I recognize most everybody in here, but just as a reminder, most of you know us. Uh, Robert Half is the uh, world's oldest and largest staffing firm, and Robert Half Technology is our little uh, IT staffing group. So we are constantly working with different companies to help people uh, find either temporary or full-time salaried jobs. If you're looking for something, we can probably find it for you or we're already working on it. Um, and uh, one thing I noticed that I forgot to mention is um, we don't work a lot with a lot of the bigger, bigger companies. Um, we actually focus on small to medium sized business. So if you're looking for something a little bit more intimate than uh, than uh, big corporate culture, some, sometimes we just want to get away from it. That's what we're usually targeting. So if you're interested or thinking you might have something come up in the future, you want to take a look around, uh, just send me uh, your contact info. I'm putting it in the chat here now and uh, enjoy the evening, everybody. Thank you much. And Mr. Vanderhaan himself, except his not related, Andrew Owen. <laughs> hey guys. Uh, yeah, so I'm with Vander Howen. We've been doing this in Portland a long time. Um, I've been around, you know, Pad Nug a long time as well, and I know most of you, but if anyone wants to uh, wants to chat, I'm happy to do that. Um, we, we do have many openings right now. The market has completely opened up. Um, uh, I am looking for uh, I have a couple of director of engineering positions right now. If anybody is at, looking at that level, um, I have plenty of architect roles as well um, in the .NET C Sharp stack world, um, non-Microsoft positions, et cetera. So anyways, I'll put my contact information in there and I'd love to chat anytime about jobs or not. Excellent. And we'll put a plug in, uh, Charlie also, sends his regards. I ran into him just a couple days ago and, and he uh, he's trying to get staffed up in a way that he can have someone attend regularly here. He's uh, got a lot more family responsibilities in recent times. Andrew's quite aware of that too, I know. So he's not able to join us as often, but we're working on it, getting them back out here. Maybe I'll go babysit, I don't know. Ramona and I had a good time with, with them, so. Here's some podcasts you might care about. We haven't had any new ones added recently, but that's okay. Uh, I believe there's a new uh, one from Software Engineering Radio that someone might know something about. Anyone in the audience, maybe? Je Jeff Doolittle, maybe? <laughs> sure. If you joined us on Election Tuesday, which very few of you did. <laughs> a lot of people did. What are you talking about? <laughs> it wasn't a smaller group. Anyway, we, we had a wonderful presentation from a gentleman who's become somewhat of a friend of mine, the author of The Art of Immutable Architecture. And that was with our Pagna group and it was great. And you got to meet Michael and you got to hear about immutable architecture and how it pertains or relates to things like Bitcoin and cryptography and well, of course, immutability. So anyway, he was recently a guest on Software Engineering Radio. So if you wanna to listen to that, it was a great episode and uh, there's a lot to learn there, a lot to dive into. I definitely recommend the book. I definitely recommend the podcast. So there you go. Jeff, feel free to put the link back in there so all the people who've joined since then can see it. All righty. Another lame thing on Zoom, but anyway. <laughs> well, there's quite a few of those, so. Yeah, I agree. So what we got coming up, um, it turns out half of the upcoming events this next month are Padna. So um, there are other things going on, let's be fair, but the ones that we usually pay attention to and stuff, Nobody's meeting. So Padnug, a week from today, we will have our official West Side at Thirsty Lion gathering. Uh, I mentioned earlier, that we've actually overshot our, our uh, reservation limits a couple of times recently. And, and both of the venues have been very accommodating to us. Get us another table, make it, make it work is really what it came down to. So that's been wonderful. Uh, on the day after that, both the Oregon Data Community, formerly Oregon SQL, and Portland SQL apparently are having their meetings. So if you're into SQL, you got you got decisions to make. <laughs> hey, we all probably have to do it once in a while, right? On the 17th, Agile PDX has their virtual puppet series with Ron Cartel. So that might be worthy. And then on the 23rd, we will have West Side 2. I'm just going to go ahead and assume it's going to be West Side 2. Multnomah County is still in, uh, in the red, so I'm not even going to plan for that. But I think by April, we're going to try to bring back the uh, Grand Central, actual east side, east of the Riverside um, uh, gathering. 
So we'll we'll try to do that. I think we're going to keep the get together at Oswego Grill because they've been extra awesome to us the last few months, except for that day where the ice cold breeze was blowing on us. However, <laughs> that wasn't their fault. It just turned out, it was just a tough time. <laughs> you remember that scene from Planes, Trains and Automobiles when John Candy and Steve Martin have to get in the back of that truck and there's that dog. And at the end of the scene, the dog is sitting there growling with icicles coming down his chin. Yeah, <laughs> that was basically James at the end of our dinner that night. Yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. But but again, they, they did everything they could possibly do to make it as comfortable as possible. Bring us warm water to hold in our hands, whatever we needed. Yeah. So there's that. And then once again, Rich is getting really lazy in these uh, difficult times and haven't got things scheduled out. So I'm going to try to do better this next couple of weeks and get a get the rest of the year filled up pretty soon. So April 6th will be the next pad nug. And Jeff, think about what you want to present then too. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding probably just kidding anyway you sprung this one on me in pretty short notice hey, so uh hey you were kind enough to ask what was going on and i thought well it must have been you it was meant you know, to i be. could present next month on software architecture as complexity containment if you like hey there's a good opportunity anyway so with i can't think of any further ados i can come up with so jeff it is your opportunity to shine let me uh stop sharing and you're already a co-host all right. Well, I guess that means now I need to share my screen. Yeah, it, it's helpful. Hopefully I can figure out this technology stuff. Technology. Technology, oh, government, wait. education, working together for a better tomorrow. Well, now I can't see everybody, which I don't like. So I know, let's see if I can fix that. You I'm gotta move them over to the other screen. And now for some reason, Amazon Music is starting, which I don't need right now, so. You don't want backup music? Come on. Yeah, I don't understand Well, that. you know, maybe I you mean, got back maybe. by Sir Mix-a-Lot, I think that'd be perfect. It might be perfect, yeah. All right, hey. Who volunteered to sing for you? <laughs> the, the first, uh, of course, mandatory question before any presentation is, can you all see my screen? No, but I can see the content that's probably displayed on your screen. I see this. I can slideshow. always count on you, Rich. I can always count on you. <laughs> Just because I care. He never falls for abstraction. That's right. Okay. Well, welcome to Padnug for March 2021. Uh, hopefully just one meeting closer to getting back to normal, whatever the new normal will actually be. We're all kind of waiting to see what that's going to look like. So why do I say software architecture as complexity containment? You're going to find out tonight. So over on the right, we have a picture of a contraption. And it's not quite a Rube Goldberg machine, but hopefully you're familiar with those. You know, Rube Goldberg machines are designed to maximize complexity. That's kind of like the, the beauty of them in a way. You know, it's like abstract art. Like, okay, it's beauty in its own way. It's not the typical beauty that maybe you're used to if you're into, say, more realist art or impressionistic art, but it's art nonetheless. The trouble comes when we apply Rube Goldberg machine design principles to our software systems. Now, I don't think very many people do this wittingly, but I have a feeling a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about when a software system ends up looking very similar to a Rube Goldberg machine. The trouble is you usually don't see it the way that you see it in the real world. It takes people to diagram things. It takes people to you know, present, here's what it really looks like in the virtual world because we can't see it in the real world. And here's the really scary thing. So sometimes if I'm training uh, teams uh, in system design and architecture, I'll give two teams a task, but I won't tell them each other's task. So I'll give them a set of features and a set of requirements. And as we all know, whenever you get features and requirements, there's always ambiguity. There's contradictions sometimes, there's duplications and all sorts of things. And it's, you know, that's what we all have to deal with as software engineers, software architects, software developers. So I tell one team secretly without the other team hearing, I say, your job is to implement the best system that you can come up with to implement these features in 30 minutes. Off you go. I go to the other team and I say, I would like you to design for me the worst possible system that you can come up with in the next 30 minutes to implement these features. Off you go. 30 minutes goes by, both teams come back and now they have to present to the group. I ask you a question, hopefully some of you are unmuted so we can have a little bit of interaction here. I ask you, how different or similar do you think those two designs are at the end of those 30 minutes? Uncannily similar. <laughs> They're the same system. 
Hopefully you've seen the meme with Pam from the office, right? It's the same picture. Yes, it is the same picture. What is going on? Well, part of it is the limited time frames, of course. And granted, you have to give that as part of it. And it is true that you're not going to get value uh, really out of anything in such a short time frame. But I think it belies some other fundamental problems that we need to talk about and need to deal with. So before I go much further, first, a little bit about me. Uh, as of last November, I have officially survived my first year in the Portland area. I may never be an official Portlander since I grew up in California, but at this point, I've at least earned the right to yell at those terrible drivers from California and Washington. <laughs> I'm a software architect at Trimble, so uh, the you know the denigrating of big corporations uh, you know kind of hits me a little bit. Um, I was a software startup entrepreneur for most of my career. And so I was a CTO of a very small company um, for most of my 20 years in the industry. And recently I decided to take a foray into, at the time, what was not part of the S&P 500, but as of two weeks ago is now part of the S&P 500. That is literally the definition of large enterprise. So welcome to the uh, deep end, Jeff, have fun trying to swim there. And I'm having a good time. And uh, my basic, mandate there from my boss is to help architect the future of connected construction management. No small task. So having some fun there. Uh, as you heard before, I'm also host on Software Engineering Radio. It's a longstanding podcast with a great reputation for high quality interviews. I have some upcoming interviews that I'm working on. One is with a gentleman who coined the original fallacies of distributed computing, if you're familiar with those. Hoping to have him on the show in the very near future. Um, I am also talking to Dave Snowden, who created the Cunavan framework, which is a framework for dealing with complexity. If you're unfamiliar with the Cunavan framework and Dave Snowden, I highly recommend that you learn more about that. And there's some other great shows coming up as well. One is with one of my colleagues on the show. Her name's Felina. She is a software, uh, I'm sorry, a computer science professor in the Netherlands. And she has a book coming out called The Programmer's Brain. And so I'll be interviewing her next week for a show to come out probably in about six weeks on her book, The Programmer's Brain. And that'll be fun. I've been a .NET developer somewhat reluctantly since 2001. I was comparing whether we should go the Java route or the .NET route. And it just seemed at the time like everyone in our area was on the .NET bandwagon. All the companies we were gonna be serving were using .NET. So we said, well, it just makes sense to do what the customers want. And nobody ever got fired for choosing Microsoft, which if you're old enough, you remember when that used to be, nobody got fired for using what? IBM. That's right, that's what it used to be. So somewhat reluctantly, but a lot has changed in two decades. In fact, I think Portland has been the epicenter of a lot of those changes. If you remember names, well, of course you remember the name Scott Hanselman, but he was the leader of the team that included people like Rob Connery and Phil Hack and a bunch of other people who basically, in my view, were somewhat responsible for getting .NET on the track to opening up to the community, embracing open source, giving us amazing tools like TypeScript and VS Code that make everybody's lives better. So thank you, Microsoft, for becoming what we always wished you could be. Now, if you could keep going that route, that would be great. Won't say much more there. But I will say this. There's never been a better time to be a .NET developer. And I know Padnug just means Padnug now, but our heritage is .NET. So there's never been a better time. Uh, I'm also an iDesign trained architect. And iDesign provides master classes and training for professional software architects and leaders. I highly recommend that you check them out. A lot of the content from tonight um, is my own. And a lot of it as well is very similar to or directly taken from my training as an iDesign architect. And I'll have some more uh, resources for you later on in the presentation if you want to find out more. And then you can figure out for yourself what's Jeff's crazy ideas and what is the you know, industry standard ideas from the book and the author of the book. So I said software architecture as complexity containment is the title. Well, first, let's talk about the architect. I think we're all pretty aware of the reality. Companies in the software industry usually apply this title to individuals with technical know-how or career longevity or maybe organizational seniority, right? Or some combination thereof. Of course, those attributes have their place, but they really don't give us any guidance in critical matters of things like trust building, engineering rigor, and design mastery. They don't give us a framework of expectations or responsibilities that may clarify and distinguish what's different about an architect versus a software developer or a software engineer. What do these titles mean? And do the titles matter or does the role matter? I would submit the role matters far more than the title. So regardless of your title, 
I hope that even you will recognize that you can benefit from the techniques and principles of what I believe it means to be a software architect. Without that clarity of expectations, responsibilities, really not only are we confused, but our colleagues are confused. You know, a product owner or a project manager says, how do I interact with an architect? You know, I hear things all the time from people saying, you're not like other architects. You'll see a little bit about why um, as it continues. And hopefully as a result of this, you too will be asked questions like that. You do things differently or you do things I've never seen done before. And hopefully that's a good thing. And it is. So titles come and go, but professionalism, require, professionalism requires a clear understanding what are the obligations, responsibilities, and expected outcomes that apply for people who are software architects? Again, forget the title. You can all be software architects. You are doing software architecture activities. Question is, are we becoming better at it and more clear at it? And I would say that there's really just one fundamental metric that matters when you're evaluating the competence of a software architect. It's this, the ability to identify, assess, and ultimately contain complexity. Now, complexity is all over the place, and we're going to dive into that some tonight. And you'll see as well from this that a lot of software architecture isn't about technology, and it isn't even all just about design principles. A lot of it's about leadership. And whether you realize it or not, you're a leader. You know, the old adage in the karate class was, when does a student become the teacher? Does anyone know the answer? Day two. Because when the next kid shows up, you are now a little bit more knowledgeable than the other person. And now you have the opportunity to lead. Now, what does it mean to lead? I have articles I've written on leadership. And when I say leadership, I mean something very specific and very unique. To me, leadership is not gaining power for myself so that I can be powerful and tell people what to do. Leadership is not uh, managing the smallest granular things that I can micromanage. Uh, leadership is not being buddies with all of my coworkers and kind of giving favors to some or those who I like, and maybe I don't even know I'm doing it. Leadership is about replicating leadership. It's about finding what's unique about the people around you and helping them be better at what they do. Now you can see why I care so much about clear roles and clear responsibilities. Because how can you help the people around you to be better if you don't know what your role is and if they don't know what your role is and you don't know what theirs is? So ultimately, we have a leadership concern here when it comes to software architecture. You see, the problem is people. And the solution is people. And that's the problem. So one of my soft, uh, software architecture mentors frequently likes to say that software architecture is 115% mentoring. So let's start with the source of the problem. Well, at least one of them. Feature fixation. You may recognize the background. Some of you aren't seeing those letters and numbers. You're seeing, well, you're seeing whatever you're seeing. You can uh, reference the movie quote in your own mind. So let's talk about feature fixation. I think this is one of the fundamental sources of why we struggle so much with complexity in our software systems. I mentioned before, you give these two teams the same task to go and design me a system in 30 minutes based on some set of features and requirements. That's typically what happens, is it not? Think about your experience as a software developer. How often do you get the perfect features and the perfect requirements? And I'm not saying that you should because that's a fool's, um, that's a fool's error, that's a false expectation. You're never gonna get those. But here's an example of what I think fix feature fixation could look like by analogy. You know, everyone wants their features just like a golfer wants a low score. So think about a golfer who spends the majority of his time obsessing about his score. Like all he thinks about is his score. He's not out practicing swing mechanics. He's not out learning to read a green. He's not learning to maintain focus on the task at hand, whether he's on the fairway or in a bunker or on a green. So how much money would you bet on that golfer winning any tournaments? I mean, they're obsessed with their golf score. It's all they think about is their golf score. Mm -hmm. They're so expending so much mental energy on their golf score. Now it's possible they might win a tournament. It could happen, but probably not nearly as often as if this person applied the proper discipline, the right amount of repetition, the right focus. I think this happens a lot in life. We focus on desired outcomes and that's a great thing for providing motivation and clarity sometimes, but oftentimes it can lead us to bypass the very means for achieving the outcomes that we want. So the same logic applies when we consider features in a software system. And one of the primary things I want you to come away with tonight when we talk about complexity containment is this, we need to stop thinking features 
and start thinking capabilities. Now, is this just semantics? Well, I don't think so. When I unpack these concepts a little bit more, hopefully you'll see what I mean. A feature describes our desired end state. Of course, we wanna give our users their features. So when I say forget features, I don't mean entirely. I just mean forget them in a certain context. Features are the desired end state. That's like the golfer's score, but capabilities provide the means to that end. So while capabilities are few, ideas for features are never gonna to come to an end. So before we really dive deep into capabilities, I first wanna rewire your thinking some about features. So I hopefully you recognize now, and in your experience, it's definitely true in mine, that uh, companies definitely tend to fixate on their features. And I get this a lot. I don't know what you mean when you say capabilities. I have no idea. This is the only thing I care about. Where are my features? So I'd like to introduce you to a conversation that happened in the matrix between Mr. Anderson, who some of you know is Neil, and Agent Smith. Hello, Mr. Anderson. I'd like to share a revelation that I've had during my time here. It came to me when I tried to point to a feature. I realized features are not actually things. Every feature in the universe emerges from the composition of capabilities. Yet your attempts to build features do not. Feature requests multiply and multiply until every resource is consumed. Obsessing on features is a virus. Composition with capabilities is the cure. For example, the feature of driving a car. Yes, I say driving a car and then I have cars flying around, but follow me. The feature of driving a car, where does that come from? If you asked someone, I have a requirement. My requirement is driving. Now, the, what's the ultimate requirement though? What do you really want from your car? Somebody tell me. Rich, what do you want from a car? More than anything else. From here to there. Here to there. I want to get from A to B. Now, do you want to do that unsafely or safely? Depends on me, <laughs> but, but generally speaking, probably assume, I want to live. Assume Ramona's with you. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you want to do it in comfort or discomfort? Luxury comfort. Okay. Course. Do you want to do it reliably <laughs> or unreliably? Uh, every time I should get there. There you go. Uh, do you want a good performing car or a poorly performing car? Mm, less concern, but probably a little better performance. Yeah, right. Like at least you want some speed enough to get onto the freeway without getting mowed over by a semi truck, right? Okay, so driving. Nobody builds a driving component. If you handed the driving feature to a lot of software development teams, they would say, Ooh, you want driving? We're going to build the driving system. And you end up with the driving microservice and the driving microsite. And then we ship driving and we have, Yay, Sprint One, we've shipped driving. It sounds absurd. <laughs> and it is because you can't build driving. Where does driving actually come from? Well, driving comes from a composition of various capabilities and those capabilities are provided by interfaces. Now, how many capabilities with interfaces do you need to drive a car? Eh, it's about half a dozen. The seat, the brake, the accelerator, the steering wheel, the shifter, and I guess maybe the ability to see outside, <laughs> right? There you go. So what's actually happening in driving is you, the driver, oh yeah, you're, you're part of the system as well. You, the driver, are composing these various interfaces that provide various capabilities together in order for the feature called driving to emerge. It's an emergent property. If you studied physics at all, you maybe have learned about this idea of emergent properties. And features are just like that. They're emergent properties. Think about what's happening right now. The feature of you reading this website, I'm sorry, reading this uh, or seeing this screen, right? And, and hearing a presentation at Padnug is a composition of the computer screens, the internet, the hosting provider, the, the tool I use to make this page. No one built the feature of you listening to Jeff present on software architecture as complexity containment at the Padnug on March 2nd, 2021. And yet building features describes what most software projects try to achieve. So now let's shift over to a conversation between Morpheus and our hero. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with software. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The matrix. Well, not exactly. 
But here's the reality. We've been chasing features rather than composing them from capabilities for our entire careers. And if that's true of you, in a very real sense, we can say the matrix has you. You can't point to, grasp, bottle up, build, or ship a feature. There is no spoon. There is no feature. So let's follow the white rabbit down the hole of complexity. How do projects go horribly, horribly wrong? I gave you one example. They start with thinking we can design a system in 30 minutes. And that happens probably more often than we think, not maybe in 30 minutes, but not enough time given to really consider the requirements and of course verify that they're not contradictory or duplicated or ambiguous. So let's use an example from the real world. I like examples from the real world because in my experience, things that are true universally actually apply universally. That means they apply in software land. Wow, shocking. But sometimes we act differently. And believe me, I've been there in my career, in my past. And I can share with you at some point where I've been in my software journey. And maybe you are at a certain way station where I've been myself in the past. And I'm sure I have plenty of new places to go and lots to learn along the way. But let's imagine attempting to build a construction project. But we're going to fail to identify or assess or account for complexity at any stage. We're going to assume all the resources we need will be there when we need them. We're going to assume the ideal time frame with no slack, with no risk, with no changes in cost, no, no weather uh, issues, no issues getting permitting um, it, you know, concerns dealt with, no issues with the customer being upset or frustrated with something, right? How well do you think a construction project like that will go? Do you think there will be confusion? Maybe conflict? Probably be pretty costly? I'd even say maybe it sounds like a crisis in the making. And any construction company that operates that way, it's a pretty sure bet they'd have a pretty short lifespan. Now imagine the same for a software project. Do you see the problem? I just described probably most software projects that most of you have been involved in. Me too, me too. If only it wasn't so easy to imagine. I mean, why does this mental exercise require little to no effort? How often do software teams, and if your team is an exception, wonderful. You're probably the exception that proves the rule. How often do we really account for complexity in our software systems? Everyone sees the effects of the lack of complexity, of, of complexity containment, excuse me. But the root cause usually rain, remains elusive. It remains opaque. And there's all these remedies that promise solutions. If you just follow our methodology, everything will be fine. If you just get our exciting new technology and pay us a ton of money, everything will be fine. If we just had enough software developers on this project, we'd be fine. If we just had more seniors and fewer juniors, everything would be fine. Uh, the executives think if we just mandate harder, or maybe if we just rotate leadership, the list goes on and on and on. All of this is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. None of it addresses the root cause. And yet, software projects and companies persist. How can that be? And someone is calling me in the middle of my presentation because I did not stop my notifications. So if you'll excuse me for a second while I hang up on this person. How dare you interrupt me? Let me mute site and we're back. All right, thank you for that little side diversion. <laughs> Where was I? How can software projects and companies persist if what I'm telling you is true? Maybe I'm full of it. Well, there's a few reasons why. I think one is nearly everybody is operating the same way. So it kind of lets them all offer the same simple excuse. It's common practice. It's just what we do in the software industry. Or we're doing agile. And that can diffuse almost any criticism, right? It's like, I've, I'm like, I've got the shield. I got the agile shield, ping, 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 ping. And like, nobody can criticize. Why does it take so long? Why does it cost so much? Uh, why isn't it high on quality and low on defects? And those, uh, those excuses, they work with almost everybody. They work with fellow software developers. They work with non-technical stakeholders. They even work with customers. Customers have just kind of grown to accept this as the way things are in the software industry. I think at this point, few people have come to expect anything different. I mean, it's hard to consider there might be another way to do things when all the fish are swimming downstream and you're trying to swim in the other direction. So we end up confronting an industry with a potentially limitless foundation for innovation, but it keeps settling for a dystopian status quo. Why? What's the fundamental reason? 
I believe it is the failure to identify, assess, and account for complexity in every stage of the software development lifecycle. Now, before we can begin to do so, we need to understand where complexity comes from. So now I want to talk to you about the five sources of complexity in a software organization. Now, whenever I present the five, I really hope these are the five. But if I'm missing one, hey, tell me, please, I'm presenting a theory. And theories fall under something called the scientific method, which, by the way, is one of those universal principles of the universe. The scientific method is wonderful. The scientific method says we can't actually prove anything. We can only invalidate things. So what do, we do? what do we do? We create a theory and then we try to invalidate it. And some theories last longer and are harder to invalidate. And we haven't you know, found ways over time to do so. So in a similar way, throughout this presentation, if there's anything you say, that sounds like BS, or I think you're missing something or whatever, please, I would love to hear from you if I'm missing a source of complexity, but I think I've got it pretty well covered here. So let's start with our first source of complexity, technological complexity. Raise your hand, I can't see you. If any of you experience technological complexity in your environments. Yeah, anybody doing uh, cloud native? Oh, of course you are. But you know, even if you're doing on-premises deployments of ERP software that's you know standard client server, I bet there's still a lot of technological complexity with what you're doing. And it seems like the pressure just grows. You know, every new technology promises something and they have their disciples and they have their zealots and they have their vendors. And we just embrace these technologies and very often expect them to solve our problems for us. But like any tool or technology, excessive reliance on it and excessive reliance on complicated design patterns or frameworks uh, and lack of meaningful documentation, all of these things can result in technological complexity. The next source of complexity is integration complexity. So think about the movement that's been going on for a while now called the microservices movement. And we're gonna talk more about this in a little bit, but it seems that just like Agile has become the de facto standard for how to run every single software project. And if you disagree, the Spanish Inquisition will come and bar you from Spain or execute you, which would really suck. Being a Jew, that definitely hits home with me. Um, in the same way, we have issues with the microservices movement. The microservices movement doesn't usually give us a good sense of what is a microservice? How many should there be? How should they communicate with each other? Should they all be the same? Are some bigger? Are some smaller? And if you know anything about complexity, again, we'll go a little bit deeper in a bit. Anytime you add something to a network of nodes and you add more interconnections between those nodes, you increase complexity. So the more components or modules or what have you inside your system, the more integration complexity you are going to have. Now, does that mean I'm saying monoliths are the answer? Well, no, because monoliths also have integration complexity. It just tends to be what we used to call the big ball of mud or what I like to call collected spaghetti, right? Centralized spaghetti as opposed to distributed spaghetti. So integration complexity, definitely a big source of complexity. Organizational complexity. Now this one's tricky. I told you before my definition of a leader. And I told you that if it's day two for you in the software industry, that you are now a teacher, you are now a leader of someone, you have something to offer. I think a lot of times we sell ourselves short on our leadership capacities. I don't mean everybody should be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. I don't mean everybody should be an entrepreneur. I don't mean everyone should be a manager because by the way, most managers are not leaders. Leadership is about people, not tasks. And most people try to manage people instead of managing tasks. And that leads to a host of problems. So what can we do about organizational complexity? Well, of course the answer is it depends, but I would at least remind you of Conway's law. And if you don't remember Conway's law, please go to Wikipedia right now and search for Conway's law, but I'll tell you what Conway's law states. Conway's law states that software organizations will tend to build systems that reflect their own communication patterns. Let me say that again. Software organizations will tend to build systems that reflect their own communication patterns. So if before you were wondering, what can a software architect or software developer do about organizational complexity? I just told you whether you feel like you can or can't do something about it, 
it behooves us to at least try because we are going to build software systems that tend to reflect the communication patterns of our organizations. Now, maybe you live in a wonderful organization and the communication patterns are clear and concise and everybody knows their role and everybody's empowering each other and there's trust all over the place. Great, good for you. I have a feeling most organizations fall further on the spectrum towards dysfunction in this regard. And it shows up in the way that people lack trust for each other, the ways they don't empower each other, but they seek to hold on to power for themselves, or they only distribute it to the few, the connected, and they don't have clarity. Most people don't know what their job is, just like most companies don't even know what business they're in. So organizational complexity is something we have to tackle, because if we can get Conway's law working for us by reducing the complexity of the organization, then we actually have a shot of reducing the complexity of our systems. You probably, if you're like me, you may be thinking of Jeff Bezos right now in the two pizza rule. And that's a example. I don't think we should slavishly follow that and say, oh, we should all be like Jeff Bezos and have a two pizza team rule, right? No team can be larger than it can be fed by two pizzas. But the concept is here. It's a way to deal with organizational complexity and we must. Then there's operational complexity. Most software projects experience maintenance burdens that grow and grow and grow over time. Uh, deployment processes instill fear, they instill doubt, right? We deploy every six months, we deploy every nine months, we deploy once a year. Now, here's the real kicker about operational complexity, and I've seen this multiple times over, and I wonder if you have as well. A lot of organizations jump straight to this. They go to operational complexity. We're gonna invest in better cloud infrastructure. We're gonna invest in better ops. We're going to invest in making what we've already built better. That's not a bad thing, but it's not enough. Focusing on operational complexity basically means you're bypassing those first three areas of complexity that I just mentioned. Think about it. If you had addressed and thought through technological complexity, what technologies do we really need to use? How can we limit the amount that we use to what we actually need, not just what seems to be the new hotness? If we actually dealt with integration complexity, how many components do we actually need and how should they really interact? Are there any constraints on that? If we actually dealt with organizational complexity, then the need to address operational complexity is re uh, reduced by many factors, possibly even by orders of magnitude. So it's important that we're aware of operational complexity, but I would submit we probably need to spend more time on the first three instead of putting most of our eggs in the operational complexity basket. And finally, I'll challenge you again to get out of your mindset. You know, the joke is that software developers are people that sit in basements and they drink Red Bull and you just have to shove pizza and Pepsi under the door, you know, once every couple of days and out comes code and out comes systems and out comes features. But I think it's important that we understand the market. It's important because the systems that we build are complex enough. Then we put them out into a market. And what's more complex than the market space? I mean, some people build you know, code for free. They do open source. But even that stuff goes out into a market. right? There's competition even among open source projects. And there's natural selection pressures on those projects as there are on for-profit projects and companies as well. So it's good for us to understand that we're putting these systems out into a complex market. And if we can design our systems to address that complexity, then we can build better systems. So I've told you about the sources of complexity. Let me stop for a second and ask, does anyone have any questions so far about the sources of complexity or feature fixation or anything I've said to this point? Don't see any. All right, cool. Well, let's go on. So I've told you containing complexity is important. And you're aware, I'm sure, that every software project is going to face complexity. Now, I've noticed this. And in my early days, I built apps like this that are basically what you might call forms over data. Anyone out there build forms over data apps? Right? You basically have a thin client of some kind. It could have been a web app, could have been Microsoft Access. Oh my gosh, could have been Fox Pro, whatever it was. And then you have some backend, maybe it's a SQL database or Postgres or whatever it might be. And basically what you do is you make some tables, you slap some data on a form, you put a couple bit of validations on it and you say, here user, fill out these forms. Now what that does is it completely shifts the burden of complexity onto the end user. 
what happens in this situation is that expert users with tacit knowledge become effectively irreplaceable. You see this in software systems that require tons of training. You see this in software systems where one key person threatens to leave and suddenly they get a massive raise and a promotion or they leave and things fall apart <laughs> because nobody knows how to do what they did. Oh, well, they did this form of that. And they printed the report and then they went to Excel and then they export it and then they CSV it and then they import it. And then, they, oh my gosh, nobody knows what the hell is going on. Why? We've shifted the burden of complexity to the end user in most of our systems. This is like you trying to drive your car down the road while you are calibrating the catalytic converter you are controlling the flow rate of the fuel pump and you are controlling the timing of the fuel injectors. And that's what it takes to drive a car. Good luck. Hey, but we shipped driving because we built a, built a feature. <laughs> so a lot of software projects also let complexity run rampant by chasing fads. I mean, I mentioned microservices before, uh, and that's one example that's highly relevant to us. And I'm not completely down on microservices. It's just, we may not mean the same thing when we say microservices. So in the first case, complexity is shifted to the end user. What happens with most microservices applications is now we're just shifting complexity from the user to the front end application. And I'm sure you've seen this. Why is the app slow? Well, I don't know. Let's open up our Chrome tools or Edge tools or whatever your flavor of the month, Firefox tools. And let's look and see the network traffic. Oh, dear God, we're making 200 network calls. And one of them takes 10 seconds to load. And this other one is, you know, sometimes it takes two milliseconds and sometimes it takes three seconds or what, five minutes or whatever. Okay, so now we've shifted the complexity from the, uh, the end user itself to the front end. And now we have all this orchestration happening in our front end applications. So now you try to have multi-step interactions. What happens when one of the API calls fails? Ooh, hmm. now the front end has to do rollback logic. And now it's almost trying to do orchestration and manage transactions. Ooh, and then I have this question for you. When your organization hires software developers, do juniors typically end up working primarily on backend systems or primarily on front end systems? Hmm. So what you just told me is that you shift complexity from the end user to the front end application and then put your least experienced, least expensive developers on that task. Now what you've done is shifted it from a person who at least had a hope because they know their industry, they know the data, they know kind of what needs to happen. And now you shifted it to somebody who's not only inexperienced in software, but is inexperienced in the business as well. This is probably the worst possible thing that could have been done. Crazy. And it's called Tuesday in the software industry. I mean, we do this all the time. So now all this stuff is unpredictable. It's unreliable. I mean, our, our calls to backend services are chatty and complicated. Performance tuning is a nightmare because you know the front end application relies on so many disparate endpoints that it's almost impossible to figure out where performance problems are coming from or where errors are coming from. Here's the reality. Complexity reigns supreme whenever and wherever it can. I mean, it's like Murphy's law. It's an uncontrovertible fact of the universe. If you let complexity take over, it will. And the results speak for themselves. What do we see? Diminishing velocity, mounting costs, waning motivation, ineffective communication, broken promises, fear, doubt, hedging, sandbagging, buck passing, guessing. So if we ignorantly ignore or pridefully dismiss complexity, we're just kicking the can down the road until we feel the results tangibly and viscerally. That is the feeling of being contained. No, I did not take this picture from inside a prison cell, Rich. But I will say that it is good for us to remember, you need to contain complexity or it will contain you. Now, there's only one effective professional response to these realities. What is it? Complexity containment, which is not a silver bullet. It's not a magical remedy. It actually requires creativity, tremendous amounts of effort, and engineering rigor. So you've tracked with me this far. What does any of this have to do with software architecture? The answer is simple. It has everything to do with it. Our industry lacks a clear definition of roles, as I've said before. And you know how we define what a software architect is, I don't care what your title says but there are elements of what it takes to be an architect that you can and that you should learn as a software 
developer. So how do we contain complexity? Let's shift gears. I've shown you the sources of complexity. I've talked some about feature fixation. Now let's shift gears. And this will be the last major uh, component that we talk about in our time together tonight is, what do we do to actually contain complexity? You've shown us the problem space. Can we start exploring the solution space a little bit? Of course we can. So here's the first thing you have to do as a software architect. First, you have to know the core use case of the business. What does the business do? What is the reason that the business exists? What would you see on a marketing brochure that describes what the business does? Now that may sound simple at first, but the ability to do so effectively and efficiently takes a lot of practice and training can actually help as well. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. And I would say if it's easy, you should probably check yourself. And you might go do some research to validate and make sure, but again, your goal as a scientist should be to invalidate your assumptions before you assume you're right. And then what you need to do is from that, you need to discover the minimum number of possible capabilities that you can conceive of that can be composed together to fulfill that core use case and all the other use cases of the business, all of them. So let's start before we go with that, why all of them? Because that sounds pretty daunting. But first let's start with this. Why do we need the minimum number of nodes in the network? Let's talk about complexity a little bit because complexity kills. We want the fewest number of possible components in the system. So actually, I think I need to go back. Hang on one sec. Nope, that was right. Okay, so here we see three different networks of whatever you want them to be. Okay, they're, they're nodes and then they're interactions between the nodes, okay? So if you look on the left, there's a, a very complex network. But I want you to start here in the middle, seven nodes, and it's acyclic, meaning there's no rules about who can call who, okay? It's just they can all call each other. Now, it may not look like it from this diagram, but when you have seven nodes in a network with no constraints on their interactions, there are a possible 5,040 unique combinations of those seven components in the seven nodes acyclic diagram in the middle. 5,040. You know, the human mind is only capable of carrying about 10 things in its head at the time, or at a given time, 10. And that's about the best we can do. I mean, it, there's a reason phone numbers are 10 digits. There's a reason social security numbers are nine. Your credit card number is 16. Some of us have memorized our credit card number and our expiration date and our CVV code. But actually that means we've memorized probably two eight digit chunks, a four digit chunk and a three digit chunk independently. Right, it's like a fractal. We, at this layer of complexity, we know four things and then we drill down and we know this thing, this thing, this thing, right? Okay, so 5,040 unique combinations. Most microservices architectures comprise how many components would you say? Dozens, <laughs> probably. And how many constraints are there on the interactions between those microservices? Probably not many. Okay, now let's do this. Let's have some fun. Let's double the number of nodes. And I don't have the picture of this one. Actually, I do have the picture. No, I don't, I don't have the picture, but anyway, that's okay. You get the idea. <laughs> double it from seven to 14. So when we double the number of nodes from seven to 14, does anyone know the answer of how many possible combinations there are of 14 nodes in a network with absolutely zero constraints on the interactions between these 14 nodes? The answer? How old? 14 factorial. Yes, it's 14 factorial, which is 87,178,291,000 and 200. Thank God your existing systems don't suffer from these power laws and network effects, right? Well, sort of. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> if only. All right, so let's do this. Part of complexity containment is about constraints. We've got to have constraints in our systems, okay? Constraints are good. An artist who has no constraints cannot give you an oil on canvas. Michelangelo without constraints cannot give you the Sistine Chapel, he cannot give you the David. Leonardo da Vinci without constraints cannot give you flying machines that were amazing. And man, if he'd made them, it would've been really cool if they'd actually worked too. All right, so we need to reduce the, or we need to add constraints to our system. So in the network on the right, we introduce a rule with our seven items in our network. These four components at the top may speak downward to these three components at the bottom. And I'll even add one more rule. Maybe these ones at the top are allowed to talk across to each other and the ones at the bottom are not. How many possible interactions are there between these seven items in this network? 24. 
I would argue, or if anyone wants to argue whether that's complexity containment or not, I would love to hear the argument, <laughs> okay? We've gone from over 87 billion down to 5,040. And by introducing two simple constraints, we've now taken the seven known network down to a very low number of just 24 interactions. That's amazing. That's so, hey, we've reduced complexity. Mission accomplished? No, nope. We've still got more work to do. But I'll ask you this, assume for the moment that these three networks represent a software system and you're interviewing at a company or you're interviewing for a new job in your current company. Which of these three systems do you think provides the most predictability? Which provides the least risk, the lowest cost? Which one has the easiest testability burden? Which one do you think has the best chance for quality? Which one do you think has the minimum of conflict? If software systems reflect the organizational structures of the companies that build them, which company do you want to work for? <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. So maybe you're thinking this is only good on greenfield projects. I mean, Jeff, you can tell us all about this complexity containment garbage, but you know, we have an existing system that we have to deal with. All right, I'm going to breeze through this, but you've probably recognized this. And if you haven't, well, now you will. This is the, the spectrum of complexity that most uh, companies find themselves in. This is the whipsaw effect, okay? Maybe we started with the monolith of doom. Maybe we started with microservice madness. It doesn't matter. But what we tend to do is we tend to say, ooh, we, we're moving towards too much monolith of doom. We need to start decoupling things and pulling them out and start moving towards this distributed spaghetti. And then things start to get out of control. And we say, well, maybe we can buy tech, uh, buy putting different technologies together and grouping those, or maybe by taking different features and grouping them together, we can get away from this microservice madness. And you heard what I said before about, you know, features and technologies being your uh, design constraints. No, 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 no. Nope. It needs to be about capabilities. So you go back and forth and let's be honest. It usually looks more like this. Does it not? <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So what are we actually going to do? What are we actually going to do? Well, we need some complexity containment strategies, all right? Now, I mentioned before, you need to understand the core use case of the business. Now, we are not gonna have time for me to ask you the questions. This is a little more fun, interactive in person anyway, but I'll just ask, and hey, if Rich wants to answer something, uh, what business is McDonald's in? Burger business. The burger business, right? No. The McDonald brothers thought they were in the burger business. Then along came a, we could probably call him a shark, uh, a man named Ray Kroc. And Ray Kroc knew what business McDonald was in, and he ran the McDonald brothers out of the business because he knew that the business of McDonald's is not burgers, it's real estate. And it's important to know the core use case of the business because it helps the business to succeed. It also helps us design systems that actually fulfill the needs of the business. Location, location, location. Location, location, location. Thank you. How about Nike and Coke? Did you know they're in the same business? Nike and Coca-Cola? Same business. What? Shoes and beverages? They're not in the shoes and beverages business. What business are they in? Lifestyle and branding. It helps to know the core use case of the business. It really does because we want to design systems that actually help them do what they need to do. So someone we love to hate, an institution we love to hate, the DMV. <laughs> what is the core use case of the DMV? Why does the DMV exist? Now, don't say to take money from us for no use, you know, useful purpose. Honestly, like what are they actually existing to do? And I'll tell you, cause we don't have time to go through it, but it would be fun maybe some other time to do that. And maybe you'll forget the answer by then and we can have some fun with this. The DMV verifies, that's it. That's what they do, they verify. What goes in? Information about people and vehicles. What comes out? Whether those things are verified or not and whether something needs to happen to get them verified. That is it, that is all the DMV does. I just told you in a couple of sentences, all you need to know to handle every single use case of the DMV, the ones you know about, the ones you don't, the ones that currently exist and all the future ones, assuming the DMV is always dealing with people and vehicles. Now, if the business changes in its very nature, then fine, your architecture is not gonna stand up to that. But as long as the DMV is dealing with the verification of vehicles and people, vehicles and operators, there you go. That's it. The fundamental nature of the DMV is verify. Construction companies, this one's easy. Ah, but I told you, just because it's easy doesn't mean you don't do the work. And I did a lot of work to arrive. And you're gonna say, Jeff, you did work on this? What's wrong with you? Yes, yeah. I took about six weeks to make sure 
Absolutely sure. Because remember, you kid yourself about McDonald's, you kid yourself about Nike and Coke, and you kid yourself about the DMV. Construction companies exist to do one thing. What is it, Rich? Build buildings. They build stuff. They do. They do. But you got to be careful too, because sometimes they create the materials they need to build stuff. Sometimes they outsource that. Uh, sometimes they demolish things. Ooh. Uh, sometimes they need to service the things that they build. So then you say, oh, well, maybe it isn't build. Maybe those need to be some of our core use cases as well. And then you go through a process over and over again. And here's where I arrived at. All the things you need to be able to do those other things, you can do if you can build. There you go. Okay. But I had to do work to discover that. That took effort. It took creativity. It took time. It took interviewing lots of construction industry experts and construction software developers who've been in the industry for decades. And I do mean decades because the division within Trimble that I work for has software that has been in use literally since before I was born in the early 70s. It's pretty crazy. So what are our complexity containment strategies? There are four. Okay. And again, if there's more, tell me. But these are the four I've identified so far. The first is you need to identify capabilities. Second, you need to enforce constraints. We talked about that a little bit before. Third, you need to clarify communication. And fourth, you need to commit to vigilance. Let me unpack those a little bit. What does it mean to identify capabilities? Number one, discover, define, and distill the minimum number of capabilities required to fulfill the core use case of the business. Now, unfortunately, I cannot show you the capabilities required to fulfill every construction company use case. Why? Because I work for Trimble and it's their IP because I built it as work product for them. But I can tell you that I have distilled the construction company or the construction industry down to the minimum possible number of components. And it's a theory that still needs to be invalidated more and more. But we've been trying to invalidate it for almost a year and a half and it keeps getting better and stronger as we try to invalidate it. That's the great thing about invalidating things is it makes them stronger, not weaker. Second, enforce constraints. This means you need to focus on the value proposition and you need to explicitly document budgets, timeframes, quality metrics, service level agreements, and service level objectives, security requirements, et cetera. Now, if you're not familiar with service level agreements versus service level objectives, I wanna tell you something very important. Never, 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 never let anybody talk to you about performance or latency unless they have an SLA and an SLO. Done. End of conversation. Don't tell me about performance. We're going to add this centralized point of ingress to our entire system. Oh, that's going to slow things down. So it reduces complexity in the system. Yeah, but it's going to slow things down. It's going to make them less performant. Okay, what's your SLA for that? What do you mean? What's the service level agreement? If this adds three milliseconds of latency to every call, is that going to break our SLAs? Well, we don't have an SLA. There you go. Stop talking performance and latency until you give me an SLA. An SLA is an agreement of a minimum amount of service that you will provide. Three nines, four nines, five nines, six nines, amounts of latency, uh, disk availability, whatever these things might be, compute availability, memory availability. That's an SLA, an SLO is the objective. So you might say that our SLA is, we provide 50 millisecond and no greater latency on every call um, on a you know 98% basis, right? Occasionally there's a, there's a hiccup or a flaw or whatever, right? Whatever, that's an SLA. An SLO is what you're shooting for. You should always have SLAs and SLOs because the agreement is not enough. Because what will happen is software developers will build the system right up to the SLA and stop. Mm. Would you get on a footbridge that was only built to handle the weight of a 200 pound weight? No. Why? Because I'm bigger than that. <laughs> now, what if you only weigh 100 pounds though, Rich? <laughs> yeah, that feels a little better, but yeah. Is 2X enough? You seen those commercials with the trucks where they're hanging from the ceiling? Yeah. What do you think that metal rope is rated to carry? What's its carrying capacity? Is it oh. one ton, two ton, four ton? It's over a hundred thousand pounds. 10 X. Why? <laughs> well, because if you want to know something safe, you probably want some decent margin for error. And have you noticed that software systems tend to have logarithmic and law of large numbers problems? like DDoS attacks, or uh, somebody you know, does spins up something in your Azure or your AWS and suddenly you have a huge cost you didn't expect, that's right. We're dealing with exponential scale problems here. 
and they require things like SLAs and SLOs to help contain the complexity. So please define constraints and please enforce them. Next, you have to clarify communication. There need to be clear roles and clear lines of communication between the people in your teams. And I do think one of the things that I would say is definitely worth emulating from Jeff Bezos, whether you do the two pizza rule or not, is this. Leverage contracts as the connecting point between teams and services. Contracts. When I say contracts, you could think protocols if you're a, a Swift or iOS person. You could think interfaces if you're a .NET person uh, or a TypeScript person. But don't worry about the technical implementation details so much as the concept. This is our contract. This is what we provide. These methods, this data, this is what you get. That's it. There's your contract, go. That's all you can do when you talk to each other. That's one way to do it. But in general, you need to clarify communication. You also need to clarify roles. I'm not gonna have time to tell you what your job is tonight, unfortunately, or the job of your product manager or the job of your product owner or the job of developer versus an architect. But I did, well, I told you the job of an architect. Um, but if you wanna know those, I'll have some resources later and you can read about it. Finally, you have to commit to vigilance. This means that we need to find ways to empower all stakeholders to keep out a sharp eye for complexity. You know, Toyota was so successful back in the day, not because they had Kanban boards, not because they had standups, uh, not because they did Scrum. And don't even get me started about what Scrum has become because it's anything but Agile and Agile isn't even Agile anymore. So anyway, I digress. A very specific thing they did that was amazing. The lowest paid person in the company was probably these line workers. I mean, maybe they were other people, you know, clean up facilities, whatever, but generally speaking, they were not the highest paid people, that's for sure. But they were given an extreme amount of power. If they saw a quality issue on the line, there was a red cord at multiple locations along the factory line called an andon cord. And if they saw a quality issue, they pulled the andon cord. Now, I bet in your company, most of you, maybe all of you, that if you had such a thing called an and on cord and you pulled it, you would be reviled, you'd be shouted at, product would be pissed, the customers aren't getting their features. What are you doing? What's wrong with you? That's probably what would happen. What happened to Toyota? Reward. Reward. They would reward them for catching the quality issue. Even if it turned out there wasn't actually a quality issue, they would still reward them. Why? Because it was better to find a problem in the requirements in the line than it was to find it out in the world. Unfortunately, Toyota stopped practicing this, these techniques. And does anyone remember if Toyota's had any problems with quality issues over the last, I don't know, say 10 or 15 years or so? That's right. That's right. That's right. So commit to vigilance. Everyone needs to be empowered to keep an eye out for complexity. And you need to reward it. When people effectively contain complexity, you need to reward it. Don't reward swoop-ins. Don't reward heroics. Reward people who contain complexity. And if we had time, I would walk you through how we identify capabilities and why when I told you before, you need the minimum number of capabilities to fulfill every use case of the business, what you actually really need are four kinds of capabilities. And every capability that you create should be one of these four kinds of capability. Yes, I said every one. And once you've been able to do that, then you can start talking about how to enforce constraints and how to clarify communication and how to commit to vigilance. You know, thank you, Boromir. But we're out of time. So what now? Well, here's what's now. Go start containing complexity. Identify the business that your customers are in. Start there and work at it. Give yourself a few weeks, think about it ponder it, consider the nature of the universe, right? What business are my customers in? Really, the fundamental nature of their business. Then start thinking about in a similar way to driving, you only need those six things, the driver, the seat, the steering wheel, the shifter, the brake, and the accelerator, right? There's a small number of things. Okay, what's the fewest number of things you could conceive of that if you put them together could allow you to fulfill that for your customers, right? Like what do construction companies do? And then how can I organize those things together to fulfill the things that they do? Okay, start there. Keep an eye out for feature fixation. And when I say this, I don't mean scold people. I mean, empower people, okay? You don't wanna just tell them stop fixating on features. What you wanna say is let's talk about capabilities. Let's talk about how capabilities can give you the features that you want. And now you shift the conversation and you're empowering people instead of shutting them down. Know the five sources of complexity, technological, integration, organizational, operational, and market, 
remember that you need to start, if, if you can, uh, you need to start putting your emphasis on technological integration and organizational and not just on operational complexity. And it's good for you to know the market that you're deploying your software into. It will make your software better, it will make you better, and it will make your customers happier. And then begin applying the four complexity containment strategies. Start identifying capabilities, start enforcing constraints, start clarifying communication, and commit yourself to vigilance. I will be a complexity container or one who contains complexity, because that sounds weird. <laughs> I will be someone who contains complexity and I identify it and I am vigilant when I do that. So if you wanna know more about how to actually implement this in the real world, well, you can find me online. I have a lot more to say about this, as you can imagine, but you can go to jeffdoolittle.com and I'm pretty much everywhere on the internet as Jeff Doolittle, GitHub, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Face, you, Twit, whatever place it is, right? I also highly recommend that you get the book Writing Software by Yuval Lowy. You can find that book at writingsoftware.org. There are very few books that I would say are required reading for a software developer or engineer because books, to be honest, are a dime a dozen. And I won't show you a book right now that I, that I would love to show you, but this is going to be public to the internet. But I bought a book recently and it was all about supposedly architecture. And I opened up the book and almost everything in the book was about technologies and tools. And I just shook my head because we focus way too much as an industry on calling someone an architect because they have technological knowledge or they have strong opinions and force everybody and bend them to their will, or they've been around for a while uh, or they have seniority, right? Whatever it might be. Now, we definitely need architects to be competent technicians. They need to be competent with their tools. And in fact, they need to be excellent with them, but at least competent. But where we don't put enough emphasis is on design. What I'm really describing to you in this presentation is the beginnings of a discipline that would best be called design engineering, not SARFO architecture. We're talking about engineering rigor, engineering discipline applied to the software industry, where we actually design our systems, design our company organizational structures, design our teams, make our technology choices in a way that does our ultimate job, which is to contain complexity. So you can learn a lot more about that uh, by looking at my website, by reading Yuval's book and finding more about iDesign. Finally, exploring, oh, real quick, I was gonna show you the book. So here you go. Find it on amazon.com as well and wherever fine books are sold. Look, it's really short. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you know me, you know I like to mark up my books. So would you say this is a dense book or a not so dense book? Yeah, I marked it up a lot. And then, I actually have a spare copy of this. And if anyone is interested, I just might find a way to get it to you. This is called Exploring Requirements by Gauss and Weinberg. This is literally the Bible on requirements. Now, do you deal with requirements in your job? Sure you do. To me, anyone who's in the product ownership category of any kind, product manager, product director, uh, even like a head of strategy or whatever, whoever you are, okay? You've got to read this book because this book can give you the tools you need to actually discover whether you have real requirements or whether you have solutions masquerading as requirements or whether there's ambiguity in the requirements, whether we really have shared understanding of the requirements, because no matter how good your requirements are, if the developers don't really understand them, they're not gonna build what you want them to build, right? So a couple of resources for you, if you would like to go deeper down the rabbit hole on your complexity containment journey, which will make you a better software professional. And that's it for me. So thanks for having me, everyone. And I'll open it up for any questions you might have. Hunter says, tell us how you really feel. I don't remember what that was in reference to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you remember, Hunter? Uh, I mean, just, you know, towards the end there, you're ramping up, concluding. It was everything. Ah, yeah, I, I, uh, I how many I times did you say, don't get me started? That was, oh, I don't know. Probably too many. And that, that and, was in reference to don't get me started. Ah, nice. Well, tell me how you really feel. No, no. Exactly. Exactly. I was trying to encourage you. Yeah, no, it's great. And you know, hopefully you can see that I, you know, I'm passionate, but I'm not angry. I'm just, Hey, I want us to be the best we can be. Right. And uh, I see some areas where we can improve. 
And if anything I said you disagree with, hopefully that doesn't call to you to commit the genetic fallacy and throw out everything else I said. The genetic fallacy is the fallacy that, well, I can't trust the source of the message, so I don't trust anything else about the message. Don't do that. Uh, find the things that you agree with, find the things you don't agree with. And there's a lot more to learn here. And more than anything, I just want the software industry to be the best it can be. And I think we are very far from it. In fact, I would probably go so far as to agree with Yuval Lowy and say, we're actually in a dark ages. We don't realize it. You know, in the dark ages, people still had families. They still had joy. Uh, they still had what they would have considered wonderful lives for many of them. It was the best thing that they knew. And yet now we know a lot more. And I imagine that in another 150 years, they might look back at our measly pathetic lives and say, oh my gosh, <laughs> right? But we're like, what? What are they talking about? How did they make it day to day? Yeah, exactly. So what do we do to create a software renaissance? Well, I think it starts with containing complexity everywhere. All the places I showed you, using the techniques I showed you. And Yuval's practice primarily focuses around the design engineering uh, from a so software architect side of things. But you know, one of my interests, because I also have a degree in transformational leadership, so I'm also an academic, one of my interests is helping to bridge the gap between some of these principles that are more oriented to software engineers and designers and push it more into a space where we can communicate more clearly with business, uh, business people, you know, the suits, the executives, or the product directors, product owners, or the engineering managers, right, the development team managers. The better we can do at communicating with them, then the better chance we have of actually implementing our complexity containment strategies. Yeah, Jeff, I, I just wanted to comment on that. I think communication really is the only problem uh, here, and that <laughs> all others seem to stem from that, uh, some form of bad communication or miscommunication. And I think that's the real challenge in a lot of, uh, it's the real underlying challenge. I don't know how to get around that. I mean, we all can't just instantly integrate with each other and interface, but if we could, that would be <laughs> one of the best things, of course. But yeah, communication is definitely the problem. Yeah, I, I'd say it's, I wouldn't, know, I wouldn't say it's the problem because I still think complexity containment is, is a different angle of attack. And, and here's why. You as an individual, you need to figure out how to contain complexity, period. Like no one's going to solve that problem for you. And it, it takes work, it takes effort, it takes creativity, it takes sweat. You know, we, we didn't arrive at the you know, power delivery system in our wall, the three prong power outlet that gives us this many volts and this many amps and this many whatever, you know, and a ground pin, which didn't used to have. And then we had to retool everything to add the ground pin. I mean, it took time, it took refinement, it took iteration to finally arrive at that design. And my sense is that a lot of people in our industry don't look at their work that way they're not thinking about the interface and how to make the abstraction in such a way that it can stand the test of time. And I'm not saying you get it perfect the next time. Like I just pointed out, you know, the power plug was just two prong and people realized that wasn't always safe and we should probably add a ground to it. And it did require a lot of retooling. It didn't really require though a fundamental nature of re-architecting the way a house was built. It may require retooling an existing house but it didn't totally blow away the nature of how you build a house in general, right? And yet so often in software, we build these interfaces between our systems. And when they change, we have to blow the entire thing up. And in fact, even blow up the fundamental nature of the architecture. That's a huge, huge problem. So I'm not trying to downplay your, uh, your comment about communication. Again, especially as someone who has a degree in transformational leadership, I, I'm totally on board with the need for good communication. I just don't want to downplay that if we focus on communication, that that would enable us to contain complexity because that won't be enough. Does that make sense? Yep, thanks. Yeah. There's a question on the chat from Gerald. Ah. Every time Jeff refers a book, I end up buying it. Nope, that's All true. Right. Yeah, no, my pleasure. And I, I try to reduce the number of books I throw your way because there's so many good ones. But these two are this and you know of course you've you've heard me recommend uh, Michael Perry's book on immutable architecture. But to be honest, these two are way above that in as far as required reading. The only reason you heard that recommendation is because we had Mike on the show. I interviewed the podcast and there you go. But you could make it in your, in, in your career without reading that. And well, Hey, you've made it this far. So what am I saying? But if you want to accelerate your career beyond what you ever possibly hoped or imagined, these two books, these two go up one. What are your thoughts on using triple D for discovering business capabilities? 
I think it can be part of your strategy, but if it is your only strategy, you're dead. You're dead. And I'll show you why. I don't have the perfect slide for it, but, but let me give you an idea here of what's going on. So, and, and, and by the way, feel free to drop off if you're out of time. I know we're past time, but this, this will help answer this question. We don't have a specific time, don't worry. Okay, well, whatever. So back to identifying capabilities. And, and this, if you recall, is the first of the four strategies for complexity containment, right? Identifying capabilities is number one. And recall that you want to identify the minimum number of capabilities that you can conceive of to fulfill every use case of the business. By the way, there are examples of how to do so in this book, okay? <laughs> There are, it's, it's a system called trade me and it's a system for matching tradesmen with work, with jobs. And there are wonderful diagrams in here that I cannot find right now because you know, you can never flip to the right verse when the Sunday school teacher is about to beat you over the head with a ruler. But anyway, um, yeah, so get the book. All right, so um, in the book, Yuval has different names for these things. He calls them managers, engines, resource access and resource. And that's a great name for them. In fact, when we implement these in our systems, that's what we call them too. But when I'm introducing these to non-architects, they don't, they're like, what? What's a manager? Or they think, oh yeah, I know what a manager is. And they have no idea. <laughs> okay. Every system you've ever built does these four things. It just usually doesn't isolate them. It doesn't contain the complexity of them. So what does a manager do? It controls the sequence of steps in a flow or a use case, but I like calling them flows or, or business processes, but flow is short and it flows off the tongue, haha. So it's a flow, right? All right, it controls the sequence of operations. The next thing is what I call a strategy. A strategy is something that takes a particular action given a particular context. You can think of this as a function that's stateless and it's given its context, it performs its operation, it returns its result, but it's, it's a pure function, meaning whatever you give it, you're going to get the same result, okay? That's a strategy. Those are engines, and they're relatively rare. You're going to have a lot more managers than engines. Next, there's access. So access doesn't mean your standard data access layer like most people think. The best analogy that I can give you uh, that, well, you know, I'll walk through it in a minute. Let, let's stay at this level for a second. So, so access is your access to resources. What's a resource? Well, Everything up to this point does not necessarily require a network hop. All three of those components, those, those capability types, they can work together in the same process. They can talk to each other over a domain socket or an inner process pipe. They can speak to each other over TCP. They can speak to each other over REST. They can speak to each other over gRPC. When should you use which? The answer is the standard consultant answer. It depends. But once you get to resource, you're crossing some kind of boundary. Now you could have an in-memory fake version of a resource, fine, but you're only doing that temporarily unless you're using Redis or something like that. But the basic idea is there's probably some sort of IO happening between an access and a resource. That means that a resource could be a Kafka queue. It could be a database. Uh, it could be a RabbitMQ queue, like whatever it is, but it's a place where you're gonna store stuff and it's a place you're gonna get stuff, okay? So let me use banking as the analogy here. So in banking, when I talk about access, you heard me say before, it's not like a data access layer. People often fall into this trap and they think, oh, this is just a standard DAL. And I have, you know, my, my CRUD, you know, stuff that I can do. Ugh. And I am getting to the DDD point. So hang with me for a minute here. Okay, so what's happening in the access space? So in the access space in banking, you don't just want to have a, you know, a ledger entity or a account entity or a whatever, right? What do you really have in a bank? You have two things that are called atomic business verbs. And this is how you want to model your access components, okay, around atomic business verbs. Again, get the book, read more about this. But, but the idea is this. In the banking industry, there's two fundamental autonomous, or I'm sorry, not autonomous, atomic business verbs. Can you guess what they are in finance and banking? One starts with the D, one starts with the C. Uh, okay. Debit? <laughs> Debit and and credit. Credits and debits. Okay. The entire global financial system is built on the simple abstraction of two verbs. Is that a powerful abstraction? Does that contain complexity? How long has banking been around? You follow me? Did it take effort and diligence to 
distill banking down to those two things? Was it worth it? Yeah. <laughs> hey, Jeff, this is hard. Yes. This takes effort. Yes. This takes creativity. Yes. I, they won't give me time to do. Okay, I'm going to quote you all now. Never ask permission to do the right thing. Do it. Okay. So access, debit, credit. Now, I need to combine those together to do useful things. If all I'm doing is putting a front end on top of debit and credit, which your team would probably do, but now you know better, don't do that. Now, what you say is, well, I need to organize those together into more complicated flows or maybe even subflows. So a strategy is gonna give you actions like currency conversion or fee calculations or balance checks, right? But in and of themselves, those aren't doing a whole lot. I mean, a currency conversion in thin air is useless. You have to at least display it to a person or display it to another service for it to be, have some use. So now you're gonna compose these access and strategy components together to do something useful. And in a bank, an example might be a transfer. So a transfer from one account to another could involve composing many atomic business verbs with certain strategic context sensitive actions. I need to transfer from this bank that's in Swiss francs to this one that's in euros. All right, well, that means I'm gonna to have to do a currency conversion check at some point in here. And what's the order of operations in this? Well, the order of operations is managed by the sequence, the sequence component. And the appropriate conversion of currency to use at a given time is the strategy. By the way, we might use different currency conversion providers because we get better, uh, better numbers from this one on certain days and times than this one. Encapsulate that in your strategy. Make it a part of how it works. All that beautiful volatility is now contained. The complexity is contained. And then it uh, brings your access to you. So now, how does this relate to DDD? Okay, um, let me use an example from the book. If you build a house functionally, then you're gonna build things like cooking, sleeping, and entertaining, okay? In fact, it's even like what you're watching things, right? That's it's really all you're doing. You're watching the pets, you're watching whatever. So if you build the functional house, you're going to build a cooking component and you're going to build a, what did I say? Oh, a sleeping component. And you're going to build a watching component. So, you know, your agile team gives you a Bunsen burner and a match and a gas line and says, we've shipped cooking iteration one complete. It happens all the time. Same thing with sleeping. All right. So that's the functional house. That's terrible but that's most software. So then we get this thing called domain-driven design. So how would you decompose a house by domain? I'm actually gonna ask you guys, think about this for a second. How would you, I showed you functional and you can see on its face that it's wrong and, and go back and look at how your systems are decomposed and you'll probably see that as wrong as it is, it's standard operating procedure for most systems. So now think about domain-driven design. What would it be to build the domain-driven house? What are the domains within a house? probably should be fairly easy. Domain, you think about domain, hmm. The lion's domain, oh. There's a geography to that, isn't there? Like a geographic, there's like a spatial component to that. Interesting. What are the spatial components of a house? Rooms. Rooms, okay, great. Now what kinds of rooms are there in a house? Bedrooms, kitchen. Office. All right, Garage. so you create a kitchen bounded context and you ship it to your development team and they build you the kitchen. So first we need some land, but we don't level the entire property. We level this small corner here where the kitchen lives. Then we don't pour framing for the entire foundation. We pour a small framing for the kitchen and we pour the kitchen foundation and we bring in the plumbing for the kitchen. And then we do the stick framing for the kitchen. And then we do the insulation and the wiring and the plumbing and the da, da, da. we do the drywall. We do the outside paneling. We do the siding, we do the roof kitchen. Here's your domain kitchen. Great, I didn't want a kitchen just like I didn't want cooking. I wanted a house in which I could cook. I wanted a kitchen in which I could cook. And I wanted that kitchen to be a part of a house. Oh, well, that's okay because the Agile team will now return and they will now build your living room right next to your kitchen. So they're <laughs> gonna tear out one wall from the kitchen. They're gonna butt up living room to it. They're gonna do the foundation. They're gonna do the stick framing. They're... Okay, I'm not kidding you. This is exactly what happens with DDD. It happens all the time. 
and, and, and people think DDD is our savior. Most, there's a few problems. One, most of you have probably never read Eric Evans' book, or if you have, you're the special few. The second problem is Eric Evans would even tell you he wrote the book backwards. He started with the tactical patterns. He should have started with the strategic patterns. And even that's not enough because nobody knows what a bounded context is. Nobody. And if they think they do, you're just gonna find other people who disagree. So what we end up with now is this thing called the no true Scotsman fallacy. Well, they're not real DDD practitioners. I'm the real DDD practitioner. Let me tell you how I do bounded context. And we end up like the medieval scholars, I did say we're in the dark ages, that instead of arguing about what it actually takes to love your neighbor, which is probably the one truth about Christianity that we really ought to try to identify with and live, they wanted to argue about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. So instead of identifying capabilities in order to contain complexity, we spent all of our time arguing about that's not DDD, or I know how to do DDD right, okay? So is there a place for DDD? Well, I'll say this, if you know what I've told you about capabilities and not decomposing by function and not decomposing by domain, of course it has a, a space. It can help you explore the problem domain. <laughs> Sorry, I, I saw it coming as it was coming. I didn't mean the pun, but there it was. So it helps you explore the business space and it can be great as a tool to help you explore the business space. It is terrible as a tool for designing your architecture. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. If it lives anywhere, it lives in the access component and you need to expose, I told you before, your access component as atomic business verbs, like debit credit, okay? If you can do that and you can put the DDD stuff behind that atomic business verb layer and there's value in doing so because introducing that does introduce complexity into your system and you have to discover whether it's worth the cost then great, go for it, do DDD. But if you're trying to do DDD across these layers or use DDD as your top level architectural pattern, it's gonna be death or at least just a lot of expense and pain. Any pushback? I may sound like I'm all sure of myself, I'm yeah. But honestly, I, I, more than anything, I'm just trying to be a scientist who's promoting ideas and wants them to be refined and even demolished because I wanna do better, so. Thoughts on that? Not right away. Does it sound like, it, like, is this like, Jeff, that's BS, I don't, you know, whatever, or like you said, Hunter, more thought, or like, wow, I actually think there may be something there. Well, I just spent six weeks re-architecting our entire client server system, and we're not done yet. And a lot of this rings true. We're trying to eliminate complexity and, um, yeah, so that I mean, feels good. Well, here's how you know you're doing it right. And this is this this takes time to get here, okay? You've probably heard this word before, reuse. Everybody wants reuse. And we go about it all the wrong way. <laughs> OOP killed us. Object-oriented programming. How does OOP try to give you reuse? The worst possible way, which is what? Uh, well, well, watering down components to a pile of. Yeah, but there's a word pieces. for it. I'll, 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 maybe it's not as clear as I thought it was. The answer is inheritance. Sure. Reuse by inheritance is one of the worst possible ideas. Next to null, it's probably the other billion dollar mistake. <laughs> Why is everybody running for functional programming and immutability there? See, I just proved my point. Seriously, prove my point. Sometimes I make an opinion and I really do mean it. <laughs> I'm still open to debate, but that one's, I think, pretty hard to debate. There's a reason everybody's running away from inheritance and has been now for a long time. And some of us are only just catching up because sadly, and this is why I was the anti-Microsoft.net developer for so long, is so many of us are just sitting there waiting to Microsoft to give us permission for what we can and can't do. And that's a real bummer. Think for yourself. Don't let Microsoft think for you. Okay, there is a little tirade there. So where were we? I lost my train of thought. Where were we, Rich? You're muted. Help me. Help me. Help me. If we were, uh, if we think for ourselves, we might even influence what Microsoft cho chooses to do. <laughs> Imagine that. What? Yeah. But before the Microsoft thing, well, you were you were fishing for either contradiction or confirmation. 
Yes, I was. And I thought I had another thought there, but maybe I didn't. I, I, I kind of trailed I off. I have a question around something that came to mind. Um, and that is, how do you deal with change kind of given your complexity framework? Let's just take a simple change, like maybe a .NET version has now, you know, incremented. Yeah. Uh, and there's some new features that I want to take advantage of. Yeah. You know, what is managing complexity? How does that fit with something like that exactly? That's a great question. It, and it's one of the questions. It's really the only way to do it at the end of the day. Now, your question, I think, is more to the how. It's like, okay. I mean, it makes sense that if you're looking for what's complex, that it's going to be easier to manage and maintain your system. But of course, the devil is in the details. So, so what you just mentioned there, I'd make a distinction. And again, get Yuval's book, read through it. He can tell you a lot more about what I'm about to explain. But you need to make a, different, a distinction between what is variable and what is volatile. So what you just described is something that is typically pretty variable in this sense. Now, of course, it affects lots of parts of your system. But the blast radius tends to be fairly contained. For me to move from uh, .NET 4.7 to 4.8 was not that difficult. Uh, even to move from .NET 4.8 to .NET standard was not that difficult. So it, it's, that's not so much of a complexity in that sense. Now, moving, if, if you had to do this, which I wouldn't recommend, moving from .NET to Java, okay, that's a whole nother thing. And you probably wouldn't do it because where would be the business value? It just probably wouldn't make sense. Um, so what you're looking for is things that are volatile, things that change a lot. Um, and when I say volatile, I mean like orders of magnitude more change. You know, this isn't, oh, I have an integer and it can have between negative 2 billion and positive 2 billion. That's, that's variable, right? Let me, let me just stop you there and let yeah. me just uh, refine my question a little bit. I know okay. I was a little specific there with the .NET piece, but I just wanted to use it as an illustration. We have so yeah. many changes in frameworks and explosions in technologies that we're asked to implement that you know, the vigilance that you talk about is often difficult to apply just because of the amount of change that's coming at us. Right. So that, that's where I think it's, it's difficult to manage. Uh, yeah, yeah, and this is why I'm, I'm actually exploring an idea. You know, I mentioned before, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find that gap to, to create a better communication seam between architects and product and development managers, right? And so, um, Part of that is trying to put things in a language that they can understand and, and clear constraints, clear roles. So one of the roles that I think we need as an industry is uh, what I'll call the technology lead. Uh, and I don't just mean a tech lead the way you think of it. So a better name is probably like head of technology, okay? This would be different from say a head design engineer or a head software architect, a principal software architect in this sense. It's it's typically one person in a software company's job to do the tech lead role and be the software architect. Or if there's more, they tend to lean towards a technology focus. But what we need is somebody who's leading all those people with a technology focus and helping organize their technology decisions to reduce, again, the blast radius, to reduce the complexity. If every team goes off and picks their own database or their own networking stack or their own you know, framework or their own this or own that, we're introducing tons of complexity. So distinguishing between a design engineer whose primary job is things I'm showing you tonight, you have, and you have to know technology, but this wasn't, and none of this was about technology specifically, but you also need somebody who can reduce the scope of what technologies you adopt and when, and a lot of companies lack that. So that's, that's one part of it. Um, but then the other thing I would say is sometimes we don't need to adopt new technologies. Sometimes the old stuff works great and we're just chasing the new hotness. And believe me, I get it. I run VS Code and I run it in, in preview mode, language preview mode all the time. And when there is a new .NET preview, I'm, I'm grabbing it, okay? .NET 6, yep, right. So guilty in a way, but partly I'm doing it for a different reason. I'm not suggesting we do it in production on our production code. What I'm doing is I'm looking for those opportunities to do what? What's my job? Reduce complexity. If I find something that reduces complexity, then I will suggest it for our team to adopt. So I'm, I'm more like pioneering it to see what's there than I am saying, oh, it's fun and cool, let's use it, okay? Does that help, John? Is there anything else? Yeah, the, the CTO there? role is, is really you know, important. Um, and, but often those guys seem to get criticized because they're 
favoring a certain technology stack or a company. And no, course, it's true. You wonder if they're getting kickbacks, but. Um. <laughs> well, maybe you wonder that, but I think, I think the fundamental issue even there is that software architecture is mostly misunderstood in our industry. Yeah. Most companies yeah. don't. And when I say that, I don't, I'm not trying to say, Hey, I'm an architect, hire me, pay me more. No, no, it's, <laughs> I became an architect because I saw there was a need for this. There's a need for this design focus as opposed to this technology focus. And we need both. Yeah. And that's why a company needs a CTO or someone, in, again, forget the title, but someone who's overseeing technology. Um, and then somebody who's overseeing design, which is often called the chief software architect, which again, is usually a meaningless title because when Bill Gates was the, the CSA of Microsoft, and maybe I'm wrong, cause I don't know him personally, and, and, but I don't know if he would have said that his primary job was to contain complexity. Maybe he would. And if he would, I'd be like, that's amazing. <laughs> right. But that's what we need more of. And whether it's at the highest levels or not, your job as somebody who needs to be doing some things related to software architecture is to be looking for complexity and figuring out how to contain it. And I showed you this five sources. We can't neglect them all, right? Organizational, uh, technology, integration, operational, and market. So be aware of those and start looking for them. Do you have an opinion on hiding complexity? <laughs> yeah, there's a law, I need to remember who coined it. And I, I'm glad you said hiding complexity because I will say this, you cannot reduce it. Uh, all you can do is move it around. There's a, uh, the law is called the law of the conservation of complexity. <laughs> <laughs> right? And in any sufficiently advanced system, you're going to have complexity. So yeah, that's actually, I'd say Hunter, that's another way to describe what we're doing here, right? Containing complexity is in a sense, hiding it. Now, now here's how you know you're not hiding complexity. We all, it, what's ironic to me is we all know this in the real world, but none of us know it in software land. How do you know you have a problem with hiding or containing complexity in the real world? I'll tell you, your car. How do you know you have a problem with that in your car? It breaks. <laughs> <laughs> It breaks. Something goes wrong. Every that is, part. and I'll add to that, something goes wrong that's outside of the expected tolerances. I mean, we all know we need scheduled maintenance. So does your software. We all know that there's going to have to be, if I have a hybrid battery, I'm going to have to replace it at 115,000 miles. We all know I'm going to have to replace my timing belt at 100,000 miles. Maybe you don't know that, but hopefully you know you need to change your oil every you know, three to four to 5,000 or three to four to five months. Um, but it's when things break. Okay, so the same is true in software. So think about your car. I, I gave you the example before. There's a ton of complexity hidden under the hood. And then there's a ton of complexity in the manufacturing process to build that car in a way that you can afford it. You know, the original cars were bespoke one-offs and they were beautiful works of art and only the rich could afford them. They broke down all the time. They're extremely costly to maintain and to operate. And if you try to take that model and they're, don't get me wrong, they were, like I said, they're beautiful works of art. If you try to take that model and now create a factory to spin those out, you wouldn't have very much success. You have to redesign the factory. You have to redesign the car. You have to redesign the whole process. Henry Ford went back to the Model A and said they can have whatever color they want as long as it's black, not because he was being cheeky. He was trying to find a way to take the bespoke automobile that no one could afford and make it affordable for working people, despite the fact that he was anti-Semitic racist. Set that aside for a minute. He did us a good thing in that regard. Okay. We're trying to do the same thing now in the software industry and we're struggling mightily because we are trying to take the bespoke automobile manufacturing process and scale it and it won't. It won't and it's not and you can see it and it's why we're failing. And until we can read, yeah, and then I'll even tell you this, and this is the other problem. Uh, this is a bit esoteric and philosophical, but we are still in the dark ages and we haven't even come into the industrial age and the problem is we need to be past the industrial age and into the information age. And you're thinking, Jeff, we're in the technology industry. Of course, we're already in the information age. No, we're not. And I'll show you why. I just told you about bespoke automobiles. Those were happening in the early industrial era, but the industrial era didn't really come into its own until about the 1930s and 40s. And it really ramped up with the, you know, the, the, um, the production ramp up for war. And then the economic boom that happened after the war. Okay, that is when the industrial era hit its absolute peak, right? It was like, wow, look what this thing can do. So at that point, the bespoke automobiles were gone and now we had the industrial economy and everything like that. 
The trouble is now we don't need, we're past an industrial economy and those factories were built along what's called a Taylorist model. You can do some research on this for yourself. And the Taylorist factory model works in an industrial economy. It does not work in an information-based economy. And the reason it doesn't is because we are getting exponential growth and complexity, not just in our software systems, but in our world. The information capacity of the world that we keep generating is doubling at a rapidly increasing rate. In other words, at one point, I think I, somebody can have to find the numbers for me, but like, I think in the nineties, we were doubling our information or our knowledge as a, as a species every 10 years. And then after just five years, it was every five, then it was every two. And then it's, now it's like down to months. So I say this to say what I'm showing you and, I'm and the analogies that I'm using you with you, I have a startling revelation and struggle because what I'm doing is I'm trying to say, let me get you from the agriculture era when we're just starting to get in the industrial world and get you at least to the factory model. Let's at least get you there. Stop making bespoke cars and, and, and let's get you here. But we very quickly need to pivot and then recognize something. If you're familiar with the works of Nassim Taleb, you should be, I'll recommend another book. This book is a must read for everyone who wants to contain complexity. Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. So until we can go through the motions and do the Taylorist factory model, like I'm describing to you, which got us pretty good, by the way, we started with Henry Ford and we ended with pretty good customizations. We can get almost whatever we want, right? So it turned out okay in the end. But what we need in our systems is anti-fragility, meaning our systems improve when there's disorder. They get better when there's chaos. And there are companies that are trying to do this and promote this. Gremlin is one of them um, that is promoting chaos engineering. Uh, Netflix, you've probably heard of them. They have a whole team called Chaos Monkeys. Their job is to break the dang system. They have permission to bring down an entire AWS region in order to test whether Netflix can sustain such an outage. That right there is a practice that should be standard practice in the software industry. Standard. And I'll tell you why. And this is why we are not an engineering discipline. I'm sad to say, but we need to be. Any engineering discipline involves what happens when people die or people lose vast sums of money. And really those are the same thing because what happens when people lose vast sums of money? People die. People die. <laughs> they commit suicide or people starve, they lose their jobs, okay? Pain, misery, right? We're designing systems now that are getting ever more complex as time goes by, but we're trying to use the methods of the pre-industrial era bespoke automobiles. We're trying to scale it to a level that we cannot attain and it's failing and we're feeling it. And people are dying, 737 max. People are dying, National Health Service in England. Okay, the list goes on. We have got to get to the industrial area as fast as we can so that we can then leapfrog that and get into the anti-fragile era. That's where we really need to go. But we can't get there. I would bet that your company is nowhere near ready to start adopting chaos engineering. And maybe there's a way to leapfrog the industrial era. And if there is, great, let's find it. But I, I haven't found one yet. So we've got to first get to the industrial era so that we can get to the information era of anti-fragility. That's the daunting task. And that's why I'm passionate about it. And I'm not hopeless, I'm circumspect. Um, and I'm gonna do everything I can in my lifetime to get us there but I'm not sure it'll happen in our lifetime. I at least want to get us into the industrial era. If I can do that, that's great. If we can get further than that, that's gravy.